Good morning, Acacia. My name is Pastor Brian. Watching for us this morning, we're here outside in Jinja, and we praise God for the good weather this morning, and we're praying that and that uh, and that we'll be we'll be good to go. So for the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes, we're going to be studying in the book of Titus, uh, getting almost to the end of chapter three, almost to the end of the book. Uh, we're going to be focusing this morning on verses 8 through 11. And uh, we're going to be talking about some characteristics of a good witness uh, this morning. And so we're going to begin by just kind of reviewing what the book of Titus is about. Uh, the book of Titus is a letter that Paul wrote to one of his uh, sons in the faith, one of the men that, that he led to Jesus, we believe, on, on the first missionary journey that he took. This, this man named Titus became uh, like Timothy, one of his um, disciples, one of the people that he wanted to grow up and and send out into uh, into wherever the Lord wanted him to go to, to preach, to be a pastor. So uh, this letter was written to Titus to give him instructions, to encourage him, <clears throat> excuse me, to encourage him to, uh, to train up both leaders, other elders, and to train up uh, the church members that were part of the Cretan church there on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea to be to be believers that were fully mature, believers that were that were leading a life that looked completely different than the life that they led before. Um, you know, the Cretans were known as liars. They were known as pagans, really. They were known as very uh, not good people, people with not good uh, morals. And so... Paul was emphasizing to Titus how important it was for the people of Crete. And, and I would say he was also emphasizing for us today. He knew that Titus wasn't going to be the only one that would read this letter. Um, it's, a, it's a letter also that challenges us <clears throat> to be people that are serious about living a life of good works based off of the faith and the grace that God has shown us, uh, the faith that has saved us. So we need to we need to be people, um, according to the book of Titus, that lead a life that's godly, so that we can prove that we really are people of Christ, and so that we can also lead other people uh, to to hope and to trust in the gospel for their salvation. Otherwise, if it's not for us in the church, uh, if we don't live that way then there's no hope of the of salvation of the gospel um, continuing throughout history. Now, the great news is that there were many Christians who did follow the advice and follow the instruction of people like Paul and Titus and Timothy and the other uh, gospel writers and other apostles from the New Testament. How do we know? Because the church is here today. Acacia Church is a, is a witness. Acacia Church is evidence that the truth of the gospel is powerful and it changes lives and it changes history. It has changed history. For the last 2,000 years, the church has been in existence and has been growing uh, as it moves throughout different parts of the world. Uh, has, has, has pushed millions, has brought millions, even billions at this point of people to Jesus and to, save, to saving faith. So now the kingdom of God is huge, and uh, it's because of people like Titus following the instruction of, of the apostles that we've come to this place today. So this, this letter was written to Titus and written to us so that we would know that there's a massive connection between good works and effective evangelism between good works and good teaching being founded on good belief, on good truth. So this morning, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, you know, this book talks about th the fact that we need to live our life in a gracious submission and godly behavior toward, toward God and godly behavior toward everyone. So that we can lead people away from false teachers, away from false religions, to the new life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. So it's God's grace, it's God's Holy Spirit and His power that leads us to that. We talked about that last week. We heard uh, Eric Lockhart preach last week. He did a great job focusing in on 
What is it that enables us to live a godly life? It's understanding the true gospel. It's understanding that, that our salvation doesn't come because of good works, but that good works come out of the fact that we've trusted in the gospel. And so um, Paul is coming to the end of his instruction. These are just the last few verses of instruction for Titus that he wants Titus to pass on to the people that he pastors. And he says, um, he says this, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Chapter 3, verse 10, the last, ver or the last two verses here. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning knowing that such a person is perverted and sins, being self-condemned. The main portion of Paul's teaching toward Titus and all who would hear the letter is that we would be a good witness, that we would be a good witness because we've heard these trustworthy things, because we've learned the gospel. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk about what this passage means, and we'll even give a little bit more context through reading from verse 1. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to listen to your word, to see how um, our good works connect to um, what we believe and how what we believe uh, determines the direction of our life. And it determines also not just the direction of our own life and our own life as the church, but it also determines the direction of the people around us. Because the people who live around us are watching us. There are people who believe all kinds of different things. Uh, about the world, about who God is, about who you are. And, uh, and many of the things that they believe are not true. And because they're not true, they lead to a false hope, false religions, false, um, false teaching that leads people astray by the millions and by the billions today in our world. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to, to recognize what it is that we truly believe. Father, I pray that you would help us to, to see, to look at the way that we live and decide. Is, is the way that we're living really pointing people to what we say we believe, to the truth of Jesus, to the gospel? And then also, Father, at, at the end, Father, help us to realize that maybe there are some things in our lives, uh, some argumentative spirit, some divisiveness, some just some things in our lives, some patterns of, of our life that are not leading people to Jesus within the church or outside the church, but that, in fact, are, are probably leading people away from you. And so, Father, help us to, to learn just from these few verses some characteristics of a good witness and help us to live as a good witness in the world. Help us to lead other people to be good witnesses in the world so that your kingdom will grow, so that you'll be glorified by more and more mouths, by more and more hearts, by more and more lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's because of God's grace that we are called good by God. It's because of the gospel that we have hope. It's because of the gospel that, that just in, in verse 1, or, <laughs> yeah, in the last verse of um, from last week, that we are called heirs. That's verse 7. So let's read for context, starting in verse 1 so that you can understand uh, those verses that I read already. It says this, uh, Paul's writing to, to Titus in verse 1 of chapter 3, Remind them, and them means the Cretan Christians, the Cretan church, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too... We're once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But, and just as Eric said last week, the buts in Scripture often are so good that what follows them is so good, it's usually grace and forgiveness and the good things. So listen, but... When the goodness of God and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, 
but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly. That's great news. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. Beginning back in verse 8. This saying is trustworthy. What saying is trustworthy? What Paul has just been writing about. That it's because of this grace and this goodness of God, this love that appeared to us in Christ Jesus that we have been saved. It's not because of works that we did, just as he said. But it's because he saved us, the Father loved us, he sent Jesus to save us, and the Holy Spirit now empowers us. We see the whole Trinity right there just in those few verses from last week. So, that having been made right by his grace, justified by his grace, not because I'm a good person, not because I go to church, not because I've been baptized, but because Jesus loved me, because Jesus died for me, now I am in a new position with God. I've gone from being condemned, I've gone from being a false believer, a, a believer in false things, a, a, maybe even a false teacher uh, of, of things that were foolish. I've gone from those things, I've gone from being that person to being a new person, saved by grace through faith in Jesus and his work on the cross and his work in the empty grave. So I've been now made an heir with Christ to the hope of eternal life. Jesus is right now making intercession for all of us as his believers. For, with, for all of us as his brothers and sisters, actually. As co-heirs with Christ. Which the Bible very clearly tells us we are. So now we have a hope that we didn't have before. And this hope ought to change us. It ought to make us different. So, Paul is saying, this saying is trustworthy, that you've been saved by grace, that you have new hope, that you've become now an heir with Christ. I want you to insist on these things. Which things is he insisting on? He's insisting on all that he's taught up to this point. That there are a certain way that the older men in the church need to, need to act. There's a certain way that the older women in the church need to act. There's a certain way that wives need to act toward their husbands that points to the gospel. There's a way that husbands need to act towards their wives that point to the gospel. All those things you can see in chapter 2. So Paul is pointing backwards in his summary right here that we're, that we're covering. He's pointing backwards to everything he's taught in the book of Titus. In this letter, he's challenged Titus. And today we're being challenged as well that we would insist that believers will live out their belief in good works. Church, this is a struggle. This is a struggle for us as believers, as people who know Christ. It's an everyday struggle, and I know that every one of you who's watching right now would be able to even point out some struggle from this past week that has proven that it's not easy to live in submission to the authority of God. It's not easy for us to live in submission to the Holy Spirit that lives in us. That we have this, this also, right beside the Holy Spirit, we have this rebellious, old, sinful nature that wants to keep pulling us back away from God. Away from life. Back into death. That death, that slavery of sin that we used to live in. But Paul is insisting to Titus and insisting through him to us that we must be about good works. Not because they save us, but because it's through the good works that people see that we, what we believe is real. That Jesus actually is powerful. That he actually can save. And he actually can transform us. If we as the church aren't transformed, how is the world out there going to see us and say, I want to be like that person. I want to be good like that person. I want to have confidence and peace and hope like that person. If we are living in our old way, we are not a good witness. So he's saying there are some things here that we need to, that need to be part of our life in order for us to be a good witness. So that those, verse 8, um, there in the second half of verse 8, 
I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. My friends, the first thing that you have to do that has to be a characteristic of, life, of your life if you're going to be a good witness is that you have to believe God. You yourself have to be a believer in the gospel. You yourself cannot be a good witness out there, an effective witness for the truth, if you, in fact, don't really know or aren't confident in what the truth is. So, what is the gospel that you believe? Have you believed that Jesus died for the sins of all who would ever trust him? Have you believed that? Have you believed that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son to die? Have you believed that you're a sinner who needs salvation? Have you recognized, I'm not okay on my own, and so I need to come to Christ to be forgiven? If you don't understand the, the gospel then you can't believe the gospel. And if you can't believe the gospel, you can't be a good witness. You can't tell other people the truth of the gospel. So the first thing is we have to be a good witness that believes the gospel. John chapter 3, which I was just quoting, John chapter 3 verse 16 makes this very clear. It's impossible for us to be a witness. It's impossible for us to be a child of God. It's impossible for us to know this new life without trusting, without believing Listen to this. I'm going to read all the way down to verse 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish. Did you, did you notice that, that, that word, believes? So that everyone who believes in him, that's the key. It's our faith in, in the son of God that changes us, that, that brings about this fact that we will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. What is the qualification for being saved in this passage? The qualification here is that we must believe in the name of the only Son of God. We have to place our faith. That means, that means from the center of our being, we've got to believe that Jesus is God, that he came, that he died for my sin. It's not enough for me to believe that Jesus came, that he was a good man, that he lived 2,000 years ago, that he died on a cross. It's not enough for me to believe the historical truth of those things. I have to also recognize that God wants to apply those things to me. Many people have said, yes, we believe there's a God. We believe in Jesus. We believe all these things. And they've even created religions around Jesus. But they've not trusted Christ to save them. They haven't seen that their own need for a Savior is not, they can't work, they can't be good enough to earn Jesus or to earn salvation. They have to work, they have to trust Jesus and the work that Jesus did in order for them to be saved. You see, the truth is, in this letter, Paul is, is really preaching against uh, a pretty specific, well, really two specific sets of people. There is a group of people called um, Judaizers. You know, the people of the circumcision party is the way that it's put in, uh, in one of the other translations. In other words, there are people who believe, yes, Jesus is good and we want to be part of the church, but in order for us to be good Christians, we still have to follow the, Mo the Mosaic law. We still have to follow the Jewish laws from the Old Testament in order to be good, God-fearing, Bible-believing uh, Christians. This is not what Jesus required of us. You've just heard from John chapter 3. What does Jesus require for us to have good relationship with him? He requires us to have faith in Christ. He requires us to believe in Jesus, the only Son of God. That is the qualification for us to be saved and for us to be in good standing with God. Jesus did those works. He fulfilled the law. He lived according to the law in a way that no Jew ever had and in a way that none of us ever could. So why would Jesus die to save us by his grace through faith 
and then require us to go back to living according to those laws that we could not follow in order for us to be saved. That doesn't make any sense. In other words, Jesus' death would be for nothing. And Paul recognized the danger of this, and it wasn't just here, but in Galatians and other passages, in Corinthians, other places, he speaks against this false teaching that these Jewish um, believers, some of these Jewish believers were bringing to the church. And he sees how dangerous it is. The other group of people that he's focused on in this, in this book are the pagans, the people who are just living in, um, in submission to evil spirits. They're, they're worshiping um, demons. They're doing all kinds of, uh, of horrible things in the name of religion so that they can gain some kind of future that's good. But the truth is, no religion. Paul knows this, and we know this as believers today if we've studied the word, that there's no other religion, no religion period, that will bring us to salvation. It's only a relationship with Jesus through faith in him. It's only a relationship with God through faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and in the empty grave. That is the only way we can come into salvation. That's the only hope we have. Amen? Okay, I was looking for an amen from these guys I'm preaching amen. to here, but they, they, they missed it. So maybe they'll get a chance again. Um, so the great news is even, even this passage in John gets after the people that, that Paul is preaching against in this letter because he says, God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world. But the reality is what's happening in the the. the uh, Christian church is that these Judaizers are coming in and they're condemning people. They're saying, uh-uh, if you're not following the law, you're condemned. If you're not doing what God has said in the ceremonial law, you're not observing the festivals, you're not doing these things, then you're not good enough and God's not going to accept you. But that is exactly what Jesus speaks against. God didn't send his son into the world that he can, to condemn the world, but to save them. So God's heart is to save those people who are bringing in contention and division into the church and want to argue like he's talking about in verse, uh, in verse 10 and 11. They're not interested in the salvation of people. They're inter interested in, in condemning people, in separating people. And we see this in the world today, all over the place, in almost every country you could talk about. There are people who are working consistently to bring separation. But Jesus came to bring people together. He came to bring people together. So, for us, as the church, we ought to be people who bring people together. We ought not to be people that are known for the things we're against as much as we're known for the things we're for. We need to be people who are known for being for love, for forgiveness, for grace, for mercy, for kindness, for people. Even our enemies, Jesus tells us to pray for them. To love them. We ought to be, as the church, a witness, an example to the world of what Jesus would be like if he was here today. We are literally called Christians. We're called little Christ because we're supposed to act like Jesus. But the challenge that we have and the struggle we have and the reason Paul's writing this letter and the reason so many of the other letters are written in the New Testament is to challenge us as the church to actually live in our new identity. So if you've believed Christ, the great news is, if you believe Christ, you've come into a new identity. You're a new person. You're a new creation. We read that in Corinthians. You're a new creation. We've been bought with a price. We've been made new. And because we have this new identity, our life ought to show that we're different. So, first of all, a good witness believes God, believes the gospel. You need to recognize that because you believe the gospel, you're someone different. Ephesians chapter 1 uh, talks about this better than, than in anywhere else that I know of in Scripture. So I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at this. So I invite you guys to turn because it's going to be a little bit of a reading uh, because it's that good. And it's so important. For you to recognize, you can't be a good witness unless you live in the reality of your new identity. Because if you're not living in this reality yourself, it's, it's going to be hard for you 
to be a good witness and a good example and to be a joyful person in sharing the gospel with other people. If you don't recognize some of what Jesus has done for you, even some of it, you can't be a good witness to those outside. So listen to what Paul says about us, okay? I want you to put yourself in this passage because it really is about you. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. That alone, we could stop right there. He doesn't. We could stop right there. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the, he blessing in the heavens because of this salvation you have in Christ. That alone ought to motivate us to go out and share the gospel. Like, hey, if you want to have... If you want to be a part of every spiritual blessing that God has, then you come and you trust Christ, and you'll experience incredible blessing in your spiritual life. You'll be made alive. Listen, he continues. For he chose us. You're chosen. God specifically chose you. If you're a believer today, he specifically chose you. In him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, he already had planned to save you. Before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, which you already are because Jesus was holy and blameless in your place. He predestined us in love. He predestined us to be adopted. In other words, he loves you. He adopted you. He predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us with. In the Beloved, we have redemption in Him through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven, church. He lavished on us all these things with all wisdom and understanding. He's given you the ability to understand Scripture. He's given you the ability to live a life that's wise. Church, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure. And so many other things. We could continue reading. But I want to skip over to chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked, according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler, who exercises authority over the lower heavens. Who is that? Satan. You were once his servant. You were once dead in him. But now you are alive in Christ. We too, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive. Are you listening? Church, are you hearing? God has given us new life. He's given us redemption. He's given us forgiveness. He calls us chosen. We are redeemed we are co-heirs with christ we are forgiven we are part of god's family so then remember that at one time you were separated from god just like the false teachers just like the pagans just like the witch doctor just like those who believe in Science, or just like the atheist, you once were foolish like those people. We go back to Titus chapter 3. He says it again there in Titus 3 at the beginning that we once were there. We were once foolish. We once believed these, these um, really what we see them as now is crazy things. We believed these foolish things. So now that we've been made new, by God's grace, listen, verse 8 of chapter 2, you are saved by grace through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It's God's gift. It's not from works so that anyone can boast. We are his creation, created in Christ Jesus, listen, for good works. This is Paul, again, writing to the Ephesian church, just like he was writing to Titus, and he's writing the same thing. Listen, you've been saved by grace, not because of your good works, but you've been saved in order to do good works because it's in the doing of the good works, it's in living this new lifestyle that we point other people to Jesus. Church, we have to live out our faith. 
That's what Ephesians 2 is saying here. We've got to live out our faith. In order to be a good witness, we believe the gospel. And we know who we are. We recognize who we are because we've believed. That our life is completely different. That our lifestyle ought to be completely different is the next point. A good witness is devoted to good works. There we see that there in the, in the passage in Titus 3 verse 8. Let me get back there. We can see it. So that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. We have to be careful to devote ourselves to good works because it's not a natural thing. This doesn't come from the natural side of us. We have to be careful. We have to make a plan, church. We have to make a plan, my brothers and sisters, to devote ourselves to good works. It doesn't just happen. It should just happen. We should have the desire for that to happen, but it doesn't just happen. We have to be careful to devote ourselves. This idea of devotion is the idea of, of literally uh, dragging ourselves, bringing ourselves to what needs to be done. You know, a lot of times we can be led by things other than um, devotion to good works. <clears throat> a lot of times if we're led by our own feelings, or our own appetites, do we go towards good works? Mm -hmm. Is that where we head? No, we don't. But we can become very devoted to things very easily that have nothing to do with good works. That's why Paul is saying to us today, you've got to make plans. You've got to make a plan and then you've got to work the plan in order to accomplish good works in your life. It doesn't just happen. God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He literally lives inside of us, church. He lives inside of us. So we have no excuse. Now it's up to us to make a good plan. To live out good works. To devote ourselves to good works. Why? These are good and profitable for everyone. In other words, if we will live our life in submission to God's authority and doing the things that God wants us to do, then we will be a blessing to not only people in the church, but to the people outside the church. Everyone benefits when I live. Everyone around me benefits when I live in submission to the gospel. And when my what I say I believe lines up with the truth of God, and that lines up with, the, with my actions, I become a powerful force to compel people into the kingdom of God. Did you hear that? When what I believe lines up with the truth of God. And the truth of God, of course, leads me to line up my life, my behavior, my attitudes, my words, the way I say things, line up with that truth. Then I become a powerful force for the gospel, for the witness of God to go out into the world and be effective. But... There's always that temptation. There's always that challenge that comes along with that. There's always something or someone or some ideology, some idol, something trying to come in and steal me away from that. There's always someone there or something there to divide my attention, to try to draw me away from Christ, to try to divide me from the truth and, and cause my behavior and my attitudes to not represent Christ. Amen? That's true for us as the church, isn't it? And so Paul here says, avoid foolish debates. But, so this is an example where, of course, he's, he's playing two things against each other. <clears throat> the good, we've talked about, right? Believe and good works. Good belief, good works leads to good witness. But do not do this. Do not be this kind of person. And what is he talking about? He says, a good witness does not argue. A good witness, in other words, is not divisive. So, I don't know if you've experienced this in your life, but there have been times when people have wanted to argue 
with me about what I believe that they disagree with. And there have been times where there have been pretty heated discussions. But I can honestly say, looking back in my life at those circumstances, that no one who ever attacked me, attacked my position, and argued with me, um, sought to, um, to try to prove I was wrong and came in and just was, was angry and belligerent and divisive with me, ever won me to their position. Do you understand what I'm saying? Divisiveness does not lead people to the gospel. Divisi a divisive person does exactly what divisive means. They divide people. So Paul here is telling Titus, tell the church, avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Did you catch that? What did he say at the end of the verse before this? These are good and profitable for everyone. However, the divisive person, the person who wants to argue about old laws and argue about old things, argue about old traditions, and wants to get caught up in things that really don't matter, they, wanna, they just want to argue. I'm, I know that we know people like this. Some of us are people like this, unfortunately. We, uh, we like to argue. We just, we'll argue about anything. This is exactly the kind of people that, that the, the scripture here is talking against. It's saying, avoid those people. Don't be around those people. Because what they do is they discourage and ultimately they lead people away from Jesus. They lead people away from the truth. They discourage people. They hurt people. And it's worthless. These arguments are worthless. My friends, some of us, we struggle with this. We, we struggle with just wanting to argue and be right all the time. That's not, that's not going to lead people to Jesus. We need to be people who love. We need to be people who are gracious, who are kind, who are looking for ways to bring others together with us. Not looking for ways to distinguish division between us. If we're talking to someone who doesn't believe what we believe, Let's find common ground. Let's find some things that we can agree on so that we can come together and talk about, about what we believe. But if we come and we're divisive, we separate people, then people don't want to listen to what we have to say. And they ne never get to hear the truth in a way that opens them up to believing it. I hope that makes sense. So in verse 9, that's what he's talking about. If we're going to be a good witness... We have, to, we have to stop focusing on arguing about things that, that don't matter. We've got, to, we've got to stop focusing on things that, that Jesus has fulfilled. We don't need to go back to trying to live according to all the ceremonial laws, of course, in the Old Testament. But we definitely need to be very careful to hold our traditions in open hands. We don't want to fight about, about things that aren't essential. We need, to, we need to be willing to stand for the truth of the gospel, stand boldly, but we stand in love for the truth. We don't seek to divide. We seek to bring together as the church. That's our, that's our job. If the gospel decides, divides people, then that's, that's, that's up to God. That's between that person and God. But we don't want to be those people that divide people. We want to be people who bring people together. Many of the false teachers on Crete were preaching this, these lies, that we have to obey all these laws, and that's why they were so caught up in arguing about them. But that's not us. There are still many, of course, false teachers today who are focused on religion and customs and not focused on Jesus. Let's not be those people. Let's not be those people in the church. Let's be people who focus on a relationship with Jesus. We don't focus on religion. We know that it's a relationship with Jesus that saves. Let's not focus our life on enforcing a bunch of rules that we couldn't keep. Jesus had to come to die because there was no way for us to save ourselves by following the rules. So how can we then turn around and demand people to follow a bunch of rules that, that we ourselves can't follow? Jesus followed the rules for us and he died on the cross for us so that we could be forgiven for breaking the law, which we could never keep, and be given eternal life, which we could never earn. That's the great news of the gospel. So let's not go back into that dead life, that dead, those dead works, those, 
those dead ends of trying to live according to the law in order for God to love us or to save us. Because those things aren't, aren't true and they don't give us life. And they actually lead people away from the, from the gospel. So a good witness believes the gospel. A good witness is devoted to good works, to a good works lifestyle. And a good witness is not divisive. So let me ask you a couple of questions as we finish. Are, we go, are you, first of all, are you a believer in the gospel? Have you believed in Jesus as your Savior? Have you believed in him and trusted him to be your king, to, to be your leader? Is he your president, church? So how, how can we evaluate whether that's really true? Well, according to this passage, and according to James chapter 2, we read that faith without works is dead. If we don't have a faith that's being born out in the way we live, then we need to question whether we really have saving faith or not. So, when you look at your life, do you see works that prove that you're a believer? If not, there's an issue. There's a problem. There's either an issue of maturity where you're still a baby and you really need to, to grow in your understanding of Christ. You need to grow in your understanding of his word so that you can actually start living out the truth. Or you need to wonder, am I really saved? Have I really trusted Jesus? Have I really turned over my life to Christ? Or have I just prayed a prayer or been baptized or gone to church but never really surrendered? To God, never really trusted him to save him. Second question is, when, when you look at your life, are there some things in your life, some actions or some attitudes in your life that God still is still needing to work and get out of your life? Is there something today that maybe right now the Lord is even putting his finger on in your heart and saying, this is an idol, this is, this is a part of your past life and it needs to go? It needs to go away. It needs to be removed so that I can come in and fill that place and you'll be a more effective witness for me. Are there some, some areas in your life, in your actions, are there some places in your life where you are not devoting yourself to good works? Maybe the Lord has told you that you need to do something. There's something good he wants you to do and you haven't devoted yourself to making a plan to do it. I would encourage you today. Consider what that might be. If you know what it is, make a plan to do it. And if you don't have anything else, um, then let me just encourage you to this. If you don't have anything yet, devote yourself to the good work of reading God's Word, and He will show you very quickly something that He wants you to do that you're not doing, or something that you're doing right now that He doesn't want you to do. Either way, that's good works. Getting rid of the old things is a good work. Adding the good things is a good work. So let's do that good work, church. Consider those things. And then finally, are you one of these contentious people? Maybe you've struggled um, to not be an argumentative person. Maybe you've recognized today uh, through this passage that the fingers are pointing back at you, that, that maybe there are some areas where you're a contentious person. You're someone who, who just wants to argue, someone who's divisive, who doesn't bring healing but maybe the people in, their, in your life run away from you instead of coming to you. That's a big clue. If people don't want to be around you, chances are you're a divisive person because someone who's not divisive, someone who brings people together, someone who's loving and kind, people want to be around those people. They want to be around people who aren't judgmental. They want to be around people who are loving and gracious and forgiving. So if people don't want to be around you, maybe you need to look at yourself and say, maybe there's some truth to this for me. Verse 10 says to reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. This is hearkening back to church, uh, church discipline. Um, Paul is just following what he taught uh, back in Corinthians about, and, and even back in Matthew that Jesus talked about, about church discipline. And how we need to confront people as leaders. And I'm talking to me now as an elder at Acacia, uh, to Pastor Jacob, to those of us who are in leadership. This is speaking directly to us. That we need to be people who confront those who are divisive. And, and give them a warning. And if they don't submit to the warning, if they're not willing to, 
to confess and forsake and move away from being divisive people, then we're supposed to separate from them. Of course, that's never the goal. We always The goal is always restoration. The goal is always to try to bring them to repentance. But it does say that a person who continues in this pattern of divisiveness, because they are so dangerous to the gospel witness of the church, we have to separate from them. And it even says they are self-condemned. They have sought, divisive people have sought to condemn others when in fact what they're doing is condemning themselves. So let's not be those people. Instead, let's, let's try to, to bring healing and co by confronting with the truth those people who are divisive so that we can bring those back together, so we can get everybody back together and we can be a faithful, good witness of the gospel to the world. So if you find that you're one of those people that's divisive, confess it today. Confess it today. Don't wait, because the gospel witness of the church suffers because of those of us who live a divisive lifestyle towards other people in the church. All of this gets back to, all of it gets back to being a good witness. Paul was concerned that the Christian churches be a good witness to the unbelievers. And today, the concern is the same. From our pastor, as he's led us through this study of the book of Titus, I know that he wants us to be a church of good works. He wants us to be a church that lives out our faith through good works, that points people to Jesus, not just by our words or what we say we believe, but by the way we live. So let's pray and ask God to help us, to guide us. During this time, we have a special time right now where we have the opportunity to show good works to our community in, in a way that, that oftentimes we don't necessarily feel the need for. But right now, we've been given an opportunity in this COVID-19 shutdown time to serve and to love others and to show others the joy and hope that we have, regardless of circumstance. So let's be a good witness together, Acacia. Let's, let's leave this passage of Scripture and go out and do, make plans to do the good works that point to Jesus, that point people to the hope of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness again to us today. You have, you have poured out richly your, your blessings, your spiritual blessings on us as we read in Ephesians 2. Father, you have enabled us to do good works. Not just enabled us, but planned for us to do good works according to Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. God, you made that plan. And as we look through the book of Titus over and over and over again, we see the emphasis on good works for us as believers so that the truth will not be seen as a lie and so that we can lead other people to the loving kindness of God our Savior, you, our Savior. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do these things as we submit our lives to you. Help us not to see ourselves as our own authority, but to submit ourselves to you for your glory and for the good of ourselves and those around us. Help us to live this week a little bit more in submission to you, or a lot more in submission to you. Help us to confess our sin of being a divisive person, if that's what we've been, if we find ourselves being... Um, uh, bringing trouble in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces. Instead of bringing solutions, we bring problems. God, help us to be the kind of people instead who bring kindness and gentleness and love and self-control so that we can point people to Jesus. It's all about Him, God. This whole thing, all of it, all of history, it's all about you. So help us to be, help us to live what we say we believe. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you for joining us this week. Uh, hope that you'll tune in next week for the final sermon in the book of Titus that Pastor Jacob's going to lead us through. And I know that he would want you to know that on Thursday, he'll be back teaching in the book of 1 Peter. So uh, if you need to catch up on any of those things, those things are online at Acacia Church, uh, Acacia Community Church on our Facebook page. And also you can find them on YouTube or you can find them under Kasule Jacob, uh, our pastor there on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching.